Thank you so much for joining us today for this reading of Go On Be Brave. I'm Janine Frost. I'm a filmmaker here in Vermont and um, uh, an alumni of the film festival as well. I'm going to be moderating this Q&A. Wow. Um, second time I've, I've, I've watched this movie and it does not get less emotional. Uh, <laughs> Um, I heard all the sniffles everywhere in here, so we are all in the same boat. Um, welcome, Miriam McSpadden and Brian Beckman to the stage. Um, my, my, yeah, thank you for making this movie, spending such a big portion of your life <laughs> doing this work. Um, I heard from you guys that this is one of the first films addressing women, young women with, with ALS. Um, yeah, as thank we, you. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you for highlighting this at this year's festival. Um, I mean, it, is, it truly is every filmmaker's dream to be able to like, be in a room just like this. Um, and to have you watch a piece of work you know, that we toiled over and have put out into the world. Um, but this one is particularly special just because of the subject matter for us. Um, and yeah, as we were making it, we were researching if there were other films about women with ALS. And um, during that three and a half years of filming, to our knowledge, there had not been. Um, actually, as of this year, there's this film and there's one other um, that highlight a woman with ALS. And so um, we're also very uh, just passionate about putting more faces to the disease than what has typically been portrayed, um, and that it happens to young people, extremely young people, and it doesn't, um, you know, it, it impacts everyone, so. Yeah, I was, I was curious about this when I walked into the theater today, I looked around to see um, what was the age range of the people who had showed up, um, given the subject matter, and um, I think that's a, a clear reflection of, of this sort of the lack of knowledge around, around that, because I would think that younger people should, should look at this and be aware. Um, anyway, so how will you connect it with Andrea and David? Yeah. Um, yeah. I met um, Andrea back in 2019. I was working um, for a local PBS affiliate, PBS North Carolina, and they did a short doc um, on Andrea, and I was hired to be the DP on that. And after that episode, filming that episode, um, she actually reached out to us, and she said, hey, I, I'm thinking about setting this crazy, like, crazy goal, and I wanted to talk to you about it. Um, and I mean, she was such a badass during filming and I was like, I can't believe this person is like reaching out to like, you know, you know like discuss even more of like kind of her ideas. So we had dinner Monday night, uh, the two of us, Dave and Andrea, and she said, all right, so I want to set a crazy goal. I want to do a marathon in all 50 states. And to my knowledge, I don't think anyone with ALS has ever done that before. Do you think, is that like, do you think that would be a good story for raising awareness? <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> dropped into our lap. So that was Monday and on Saturday I was on a plane to film marathon number seven. So she had already done six um, just by you know setting those goals. Um, but she officially set the goal kind of in tandem with the start of like officially filming for the for this you know, film. Yeah. Wow. That's really really incredible. Um, so what thing what film did you think you were uh, setting out to make. Yeah, so Andrea started this goal when she had reached five years, which only 20% of people with ALS make it to five years. I don't think your microphone. Yeah. Oh, sorry, is this not? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, so Andrea start, started the goal of doing the 50 marathons at her five year anniversary of having ALS, and only 20% of people make it that long, and the progression can kick off at any time. Um, and as we were filming this and COVID happened and all these different things happened that delayed, 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 we didn't really think that it would ever actually happen that she would cross that 50th marathon. So we were simultaneously filming two different films, one where she did it, which is thankfully the film we got to make, and then a second one where she doesn't and she gets carried across finish lines in a very different way. 
And so it was like very challenging for us to always be watching for signs of decline, watching for these different things and trying to film that as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that in terms of the, the, the physical aspect of it for her. Like, what were some of those challenges along the way? I'm sure there were many in ethical as well. Like, well, how, how far do we push it? Like, is she, is she the one pushing this or are we now pushing it? What? Yeah, so she had, um, we had multiple discussions early on because like by proxy of having one filmmaker, sometimes two filmmakers with you in any given situation, it makes situations more accessible than they otherwise would be because there is someone with you that could feasibly, you know, help open a door or push you across a ditch, you know? Um, and so we had to have a lot of conversations about like, um, do we help you? And if so, when? Um, in Hawaii, she really was drowning. She had gotten water into her snorkel and didn't have the strength to push it out. Um, and that became very clear that like in situations where her life is at, at stake here, like we are going to be, uh, <laughs> humans first, <laughs> uh, filmmakers second, um, but that changed when it came to things that were not like life-threatening um, and how, and to just step back and to film what happened. And that goes along with your question, which um, she set this goal, it took a physical toll on her body. And it was, um, she has the mind of an athlete, she has the mind of an elite athlete, and she said, I'm gonna do this and I don't care. Like, I, this is what I want to do with my life. Um, and so, you know, as filmmakers, I think it's our job to not enter situations with judgment or our own perception as much as possible. We're always gonna have our own filter. We're always gonna have our own lens, but it was not our job to um, input any, it was just our job to document like what she was doing. Um, and that was at times hard when you see her hurting herself. Yeah. Um, but again, that's what she wanted and that she made it very clear. And so it was our job to, to just tell her story in the way that she wanted it, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that one moment where she's like stuck on the, on the path and she's like, whoa, I'm not gonna get over this hole. <laughs> like, what am I gonna do? Like, what, 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 how did you guys react? You know, for the first piece of that scene, we just saw the footage from her, her, her uh, GoPros, um, but then we like switched to your angle and you were watching her, and so we know you were there. Yeah, so uh, we weren't there initially. Um, she was, so what we would do with the marathons is we didn't run, um, 26.2 miles with cameras. <laughs> um, what we would do is we would track her on our phones. Is this one not working? No. We would track, oh yeah, it's oh. very different. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, would, we would track her on our phones. And, and so we saw at this marathon in particular, it, it said 0.0, .0, which would happen, like cell service would fall off. So we were like, okay, not a big deal. And I was like, I'm just gonna grab my camera and find her, which was like, a, it was on a pathway like a mile away, so I was running to first find her. So she was stuck there for about 15 or so minutes, um, and they had released her an hour before any other marathon runners, so she was legitimately just out there by herself, stuck on that crack. And so I got to where you actually weren't even with me, and I was legitimately first confused because I don't know what is going on, and then see that she's stuck in the crack. And we had had, at this point, years of conversations of like, when do we help you? And we only help when it's a life-threatening situation. And so she's stuck on the crack, but um, it was really important to us that this be, um, that she would have like self-determination within this story, that this was her choices, this wasn't us imposing ever. So if she was like, I want your help, I probably would have done it. I just didn't get put in that situation, but like, thankfully didn't have to do that. And she said, if I flip, I flip. And I was just like, am I gonna film her? Cause she's flipped, she has flipped her trike before, never in front of us, but she has flipped before. Am I gonna flip, is she gonna flip and seriously injure herself? Am I about to film the end of this project right here? And then when do I intervene? Like, do I film her laying on the ground? How long do I film her laying on the ground? You know what I mean is, 
it was really, really hard because this is someone we've grown to be really close with and you want to help her, but that's not the job that we're there to do. We're there to show, you know, even the small cracks on the road make a really big difference when it comes to accessibility. And that was our job as filmmakers. Um, yeah, well, so this is, it took three, four years to make this film. There's a clear progression in terms of how you do, how it's filmed. So in terms of fundraising for this piece, how, how was that? I mean, you can see there's more money towards the end. Uh, so, <laughs> so how did that, how did that go? Um, yeah. Testing. There we go. Um, so the first three years, pretty much all of production until Alaska, uh, Dave, Andrea, Brian, and myself were um, self-funding. They were helping with like airline miles because he had a bunch of airline miles. So like we were just, we actually lived out of, um, now we have a nicer converted van, but uh, we actually lived out of our small intermediate SUV for like a month and a half to drive across to Washington and Oregon. Um, and so we were just, um, but I mean, I think I love that. I love the tradition of gritty filmmaking and just not taking no. That's how films get made. Um, you just do it uh, one way or the other. And when we wrapped in Alaska, uh, we were able to bring my buddy Brooks Bennett, who is an incredible FPV drone operator. And I was like, if there is a location where we want that, it's Alaska. So um, put together a budget for that. So we wrapped production, I cut the trailer, and um, Andrea and Dave were kind enough to do a trailer launch party um, with their community of people uh, who have ALS or had lost someone to ALS through their foundation. And they said our fundraising goal is to raise $100,000 for post-production and to be able to properly have audio mixers and colorists and graphic designers. And the ALS community raised that money in 30 days. And so this film was funded by people. Um, it, it just like makes me teary because they really carried us. We had been really, like it had been really hard for those three years. Um, so it was just a really, I think a beautiful picture. Um, and then we felt. <laughs> um, and so they really supported us and in the making of this, and then we just felt this, you know, ever increasing, even more responsibility um, to do this together and to do it in partnership, um, which was always the goal, but it just took on a whole uh, deeper meaning. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that, that brings me to a, my question around community, around the, the film and how it has grown, both for you guys, but also from, for, Andrea and, and, and David and the rest of the participants, like the support that they feel like they have been getting. Uh, can you speak to that? I, I think the first thing for us was we, we, we just got so welcomed into the ALS community through this filming via Andrea. And it was it's just such a beautiful, amazing community of people who are choosing to live um, instead of choosing to die. Um, and as we've been able to show the film different places, we've just been meeting more and more people who are, um, have been moved and inspired, whether they're part of the community or whether Andrea's message, because it's bigger than ALS, it's appreciating what your body can do, it's setting goals that you didn't think are possible and achieving those goals. And, and or even not achieving them and it's yeah, about just the setting, setting the goals and the like goal. setting crazy goals and and it's been just such a like you know at our first screening that we had people went and got tattoos afterwards <laughs> like of uh, swallows to remember like the hope and and we've been able to go back and visit those people and form community with those people and so the film's actually gonna go on a 50 city uh, fundraising tour uh, this fall um, to raise money for ALS, and it's just been so amazing to see. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so it's gonna be like one-time screenings at theaters across the United States, um, and all the funding is going to be going to ALS TDI or Duke Neurology, and especially their like human clinical trial for their new treatment. Um, so that is, 
that is, I mean, seeing it all come together into fruition, we really wanted this to be able to benefit um, the community and the research efforts that are taking place. And so being at a point now that that's like happening and truly it has all come from film festivals and building a community of people um, that that is possible. And so we're just incredibly grateful. And you mentioned briefly the science here um, around in research. Um, what are some of the factors, like in the newer research, that 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 leads us to understand the disease more, or in environmental factors? Like that we understand that it's that running can be great, and running can also be really devastating for. Yeah, I think the first thing, uh, this is where I'm like, this is actually our first uh, talk back where we haven't had Dave and Andrea and they know all the science. Um, so um, I will do my very best, but please don't take my wor our, our word for it um, and, and look up more information on your own from scientists who are far smarter than us. Um, but the first is that they probably think it's an umbrella term, that ALS is a family of diseases. Um, there is familial ALS, and most of the uh, treatments that are showing more efficacy is geared towards the familial ALS, where there's a gene. Um, but that gene, that kind of ALS, only accounts for, I think, less than 10% of cases. Um, they do know that there are environmental factors. There are communities that live by blue-green algae that have um, higher rates of ALS. Raleigh-Durham actually is kind of considered a, a hotbed. Um, and they don't know, they can't say for sure that the causation is because of the algae in the water, but they have seen that there is a correlation. Um, and I will say that treatment till now extends life by uh, a matter of months. So it's three months. Um, and so that's where there is a huge need um, for treatments that, uh, the first step is treatments that are, that is extending life by years, not months. Um, but we also feel that like with this and with Andrea's story, yes, we will raise money for research, um, absolutely. But I think that the real thing of what she did was to show that it really doesn't matter if you achieve your goal, set a goal. And, and set that goal and choose to live each day. Um, and that was something that um, I think is very human and can go to, um, can apply to anyone because we all have, I mean, we all have marathons in our life, right? We all have things that um, are, and things that set us back, um, so. And I just want to say to you about Andrea, she's not here, um, she's actually doing better now than she was at the end of our film because she has stopped doing marathons and is just doing shorter races. So her body has actually recovered quite a bit. She's um, having her um, memoir is coming out in a week. And so she is doing a massive publicity blitz right now as her book is about to come out, which is why she wasn't able to be at this festival, but she is doing well. That is really good to hear. Um, it's, it's, I mean, the film is driven by her hope and and her personal drive, her and David's, um, but her situation is is in the end kind of abnormal, like it's an abnormal progression of the, of the disease. You're talking three months, you know, like of with with treatment. Um, how did you guys ad address that in terms of other participants um, throughout the process of the creation of, yeah. You speak to that. I think as soon as we realized this was not going to be a film about her declining, we were like, we have to show other stories of ALS and other people who this is impacting because her case is so different. She just hit nine years. She got her ninth tattoo about a month ago. Um, and so she's getting into like that 10% of people that make it past 10 years. And so it was vital to us that we don't show that this was easy. Or that like, if you just did exercise, you would be able to make it longer. Um, for instance, we, we showed Peggy in Oakland who was inspired by Andrea. Um, and you can see from the time in Oakland to Alaska, as she's continuing to do races, she's declining much more rapidly and is not having the same prognosis of Andrea and is not doing so well anymore. And so it was really important to us to show, you know, we 
during we were filmed for uh, three and a half years. Life expectancy is three to five years with ALS. So it was a whole cycle that we were filming for of people being diagnosed and passing away in the time that we filmed it. And for us, this wasn't just Andrea's story, this was a story of the community. And it's not just her, she's not the only one. She's also getting hope from all these other people who are choosing to live. And they don't get to be quite as lucky to live as long, but in those moments that they do have, they're living. And it was, we wanted, this was our love letter to that community. Um, they called it Andrea's love letter to life. This is our love letter to this community that just is so beautiful. I feel like there's a sense of, like, along with the hope, you know, like you are, you're daily, you're addressing your own grief, like in the, in the story, like you have to overcome that every day. Was that, how was that for David? You know, he's not the one who's going to go. How, how did, how did he address that with you guys along the way? Um, yeah, Dave was re Dave was interesting. So I think first, like something that we realize is like you don't have hope without grief. Like you have to have grief, and like for Andrea, she had to, and Dave, um, they had to experience the grief first, and um, and that was an important step before finding the hope that was going to propel them. Um, so whereas Andrea, for filmmakers, we started out. They said, we want you to film everything in our life, you know, show the real trials of ALS. And so to do that, we were at their house a lot. Um, and Andrea was like, yep, this is what I want. And it, Dave at some point realized, and he realized that he's a much more private person. And so he requested at about midway through, he said, you know, I really need a break here. Like, I, I'm more private, and we had to respect that. Um, and I think it was because we respected that, that about a year later, we had that, we were able to have that final, final interview with him, and I think he needed the time to realize, like, what making a film on their life actually meant, and to process a lot of things, and to then feel comfortable talking about it um, on camera. And so that is to say, um, kind of the, deep, the deepest things that he shared are in the film. And we had to respect where he was willing to go and what he was willing to speak to. Um, and so it was a process of just like learning that as filmmakers too, and just being really respectful of our subjects. Do you have anything to add? I think the other thing just is that like the, that we couldn't go into in the film was the logistical nightmare of what they were actually trying to do, of doing, it was 20, how many marathons? 20, she did 23 in a year, but she actually did four in four days. Yeah, so, so that. She, yeah, like she was, what she was doing was like, it's, it was insanity. But, but then like traveling with airlines, airlines are notorious for breaking like, uh, assisted devices, so having her bike get broken, having her walker get broken, having her um, scooter broken constantly by airlines, and just the, the absolute mess that they were constantly dealing with, in addition to actually doing that number of marathons that was breaking down her body, the travel was also breaking it down, and I think that he was just trying to survive that time because he was taking care of everything, and then having a camera on top of that is very, it's, I, I wouldn't want it either. Yeah, that's yeah. a big, big logistical nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, open up to some, some questions here at the end. We, have, we just have a few, few minutes left. Um, yes, please. Um, we're talking about Andrea's incredible story. I would just like to thank you for telling the story so well. Uh, we're going to a bunch of cities and ha trying to uh, cast our support with this fund fundraising effort for them. Um, we also, I do a lot of, I've been really fortunate in that 
documentary series that How I Met Andrea in uh, North Carolina. It's um, a beautiful series called My Home NC, which the mission is to tell um, underserved and untold stories in our state. Um, so I'm gonna keep doing that because um, I believe strongly in the ability of like short films as well and short docs um, to get much needed stories out to the world. So I keep doing that and. We're looking for our next feature project. Um, this was a little bit of an odd one in the sense of like we filmed it for three and a half years and then you edited the majority of it in 10 weeks because it was so important to us to get it out as fast as possible while Andrea could still travel with it. Her voice has, the one thing that has gone away a little bit is her voice is like declining. And so we're kind of also just enjoying like having gotten this one done as yeah. well and celebrating it, um, but yeah. Yeah, up there. Yeah, um, so goonbebrave.com is the website and we have upcoming screenings. Um, and then we have a little form. It's like, if you don't see your city in the upcoming screenings, please feel, fill it out. We can also get your name after this. We just, we want this to be able to support um, communities around the United States too. Um, and so, yeah, let's, let's talk and we can schedule a screening in Des Moines. Because I don't think we have Idaho, actually. Iowa. Sorry, Iowa, sorry. <laughs> I was like, Des Moines, Idaho, I don't know. We, Iowa, we've been sorry. to a lot of states. We, we're a little yes. confused. Apologies. We have no idea where we are. Um, so yeah, we would love to, we would love to, to show there. So. Could you say that website one more time? Yeah, it's goonbebrave.com. Yes. Great question. Um, we tried to engage as much of the ALS. We asked that the ALS community, we wanted them to give us feedback on their representation. We did ask Andrea and Dave to refrain from giving feedback on their own representation in the film because we felt that it was like ethically, we wanted to, yeah, that gets into a little bit more of a gray area. Yeah, and so, um, and they were extremely respectful of that. So they gave us story notes on um, kind of the ALS community to make sure that it was represented well. Um, but then we, we got to I, I don't know. Control the structure uh, and, and the, and well, the content like, of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Their, their, portrayal, yeah. their portrayal, they didn't get feedback on. There were a few places where they said, this is how the ALS community would take what was said here. And so they gave us feedback that was really vital to understand the messaging and how it would be interpreted by the ALS community specifically. Yeah, to be really sensitive to, yeah. But yeah, that makes sense. And then we also showed it to a broader group of people, both doctors, people with ALS, people who had lost loved ones from ALS to get their feedback before finalizing it. One last question, yeah. Yeah, you know, it seems like uh, supporting her and taking care of her is a full-time job. Was they also having to go to work during all of this? Yeah, Dave is a lawyer, um, and so he works full time, um, and he has been able to move into a position where he has some more, uh, I think, flexibility to work from home, um, but that wasn't the case throughout all of filming, and so that was that is definitely something that um, is a challenge, but Andrea is still, again, like, she's able to drive, um, and she is still quite independent, as you can see. Um, so, um, but that is something that is probably, that will, ha that will have to shift when um, her progression increases, whether that's hiring additional caregivers or what that looks like, yeah. Okay. Well, I wanna thank you both for coming and for sharing your work, and thank you for everyone who came out today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.